Chapter Thirteen. Cat and fox and marionette walked and walked and walked. At last, toward evening, dead tired, they came to the inn of the Red Lobster. Let us stop here a while," said the fox, "to eat a bite and rest for a few hours. At midnight we'll start out again. For at dawn tomorrow we must be at the Field of Wonders." They went into the inn, and all three sat down at the same table. However, not one of them was very hungry. The poor cat felt very weak, and he was able to eat only thirty-five mullets with tomato sauce and four portions of tripe with cheese. Moreover, as he was so in need of strength, he had to have four more helpings of butter and cheese. The fox, after a great deal of coaxing, tried his best to eat a little. The doctor had put him on a diet, and he had to be satisfied with a small hare dressed with a dozen young and tender spring chickens. After the hare, he ordered some partridges, a few pheasants, a couple of rabbits, and a dozen frogs and lizards. That was all. He felt ill, he said, and could not eat another bite. Pinocchio ate least of all. He asked for a bite of bread and a few nuts, and then hardly touched them. The poor fellow, with his mind on the field of wonders, was suffering from a gold piece indigestion. Supper over, the fox said to the innkeeper, "Give us two good rooms, one for Mister Pinocchio and the other for me and my friend. Before starting out, we'll take a little nap." Remember to call us at midnight sharp, for we must continue on our journey. Yes, sir," answered the innkeeper, winking in a knowing way at the fox and the cat, as if to say, "I understand." As soon as Pinocchio was in bed, he fell fast asleep and began to dream. He dreamed he was in the middle of a field. The field was full of vines heavy with grapes. The grapes were no other than gold coins which tinkled merrily as they swayed in the wind. They seemed to say, "Let him who wants us take us." Just as Pinocchio stretched out his hand to take a handful of them, he was awakened by three loud knocks at the door. It was the innkeeper who had come to tell him that midnight had struck. "Are my friends ready?" the marionette asked him. Indeed, yes. They went two hours ago. Why in such a hurry? Unfortunately, the cat received a telegram which said that his firstborn was suffering from chilblains and was on the point of death. He could not even wait to say good-bye to you. Did they pay for the supper? How could they do such a thing? Being people of great refinement, they did not want to offend you so deeply as not to allow you the honor of paying the bill. Too bad, that offence would have been more than pleasing to me," said Pinocchio, scratching his head. Where did my good friends say they would wait for me? He added. At the Field of Wonders at sunrise tomorrow morning. Pinocchio paid a gold piece for the three suppers and started on his way toward the field that was to make him a rich man. He walked on, not knowing where he was going, for it was dark, so dark that not a thing was visible. Round about him, not a leaf stirred. A few bats skimmed his nose now and again and scared him half to death. Once or twice he shouted, "Who goes there?" And the faraway hills echoed back to him. Who goes there? Who goes there? Who goes? As he walked, Pinocchio noticed a tiny insect glimmering on the trunk of a tree, a small being that glowed with a pale, soft light. Who are you? He asked. I am the ghost of the talking cricket, answered the little being in a faint voice that sounded as if it came from a faraway world. What do you want? Asked the marionette. I want to give you a few words of good advice. Return home and give the four gold pieces you have left to your poor old father, who is weeping because he has not seen you for many a day. 
Tomorrow my father will be a rich man, for these four gold pieces will become two thousand. Don't listen to those who promise you wealth overnight, my boy. As a rule, they are either fools or swindlers. Listen to me and go home. But I want to go on. The hour is late. I want to go on. The night is very dark. I want to go on. The road is dangerous. I want to go on. Remember that boys who insist on having their own way sooner or later come to grief. The same nonsense. Good-bye, Cricket. Good-night, Pinocchio, and may heaven preserve you from the assassins. There was silence for a minute, and the light of the talking Cricket disappeared suddenly, just as if someone had snuffed it out. Once again the road was plunged in darkness. CHAPTER Fourteen. "'Dear, oh, dear! When I come to think of it,' said the marionette to himself, as he once more set out on his journey, "'we boys are really very unlucky. Everybody scolds us, everybody gives us advice, everybody warns us. If we were to allow it, everyone would try to be father and mother to us, everyone, even the talking cricket. Take me, for example. Just because I would not listen to that bothersome cricket, who knows how many misfortunes may be awaiting me? Assassins, indeed! At least I have never believed in them, nor ever will. To speak sensibly, I think assassins have been invented by fathers and mothers to frighten children who want to run away at night. And then, even if I were to meet them on the road, what matter? I'll just run up to them and say, Well, Signore, what do you want? Remember that you can't fool with me. Run along and mind your business. At such a speech I can almost see those poor fellows running like the wind. But in case they don't run away, I can always run myself. Pinocchio was not given time to argue any longer, for he thought he heard a slight rustle among the leaves behind him. He turned to look, and behold, there in the darkness stood two big black shadows, wrapped from head to foot in black sacks. The two figures leaped toward him as softly as if they were ghosts. "'Here they come,' Pinocchio said to himself, and not knowing where to hide the gold pieces, he stuck all four of them under his tongue. He tried to run away, but hardly had he taken a step when he felt his arms grasped and heard two horrible, deep voices say to him, "'Your money or your life!' On account of the gold pieces in his mouth, Pinocchio could not say a word, so he tried with head and hands and body to show, as best as he could, that he was only a poor marionette without a penny in his pocket. "'Come, come, less nonsense, and out with your money!' cried the two thieves in threatening voices. Once more Pinocchio's head and hands said, I haven't a penny. Out with that money, or you're a dead man, said the taller of the two assassins. Dead man, repeated the other. And after having killed you, we will kill your father also. Your father also. No, 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 not my father cried Pinocchio, wild with terror, but as he screamed, the gold pieces tinkled together in his mouth. "'Ah, you rascal! So that's the game! You have the money hidden under your tongue! Out with it!' But Pinocchio was as stubborn as ever. "'Are you deaf? Wait, young man, we'll get it from you in a twinkling!' One of them grabbed the marionette by the nose, and the other by the chin, and they pulled him unmercifully from side to side in order to make him open his mouth. All was of no use. The marionette's lips might have been nailed together. They would not open. In desperation the smaller of the two assassins pulled out a long knife from his pocket and tried to pry Pinocchio's mouth open with it. Quick as a flash the marionette sank his teeth deep into the assassin's hand, bit it off, and spat it out. 
Fancy his surprise when he saw that it was not a hand, but a cat's paw. Encouraged by this first victory, he freed himself from the claws of his assailers, and, leaping over the bushes along the road, ran swiftly across the fields. His pursuers were after him at once, like two dogs chasing a hare. After running seven miles or so, Pinocchio was well-nigh exhausted. Seeing himself lost, he climbed up a giant pine-tree and sat there to see what he could see. The assassins tried to climb also, but they slipped and fell. Far from giving up the chase, this only spurred them on. They gathered a bundle of wood, piled it up at the foot of the pine, and set fire to it. In a twinkling the tree began to sputter and burn like a candle blown by the wind. Pinocchio saw the flames climb higher and higher. Not wishing to end his days as a roasted marionette, he jumped quickly to the ground, and off he went, the assassins close to him, as before. Dawn was breaking when, without any warning whatsoever, Pinocchio found his path barred by a deep pool full of water, the color of muddy coffee. What was there to do? With a, one, two, three, he jumped clear across it. The assassins jumped also, but not having measured their distance well, Splash! They fell right into the middle of the pool. Pinocchio, who heard the splash and felt it, too, cried out laughing, but never stopping in his race, A pleasant bath to you, Signori! He thought they must surely be drowned, and turned his head to see. But there were the two somber figures still following him, though their black sacks were drenched and dripping with water. Chapter 15 As he ran, the marionette felt more and more certain that he would have to give himself up into the hands of his pursuers. Suddenly he saw a little cottage gleaming white as the snow among the trees of the forest. "'If I have enough breath left with which to reach that little house, I may be saved,' he said to himself. Not waiting another moment, he darted swiftly through the woods, the assassins still after him. After a hard race of almost an hour, tired and out of breath, Pinocchio finally reached the door of the cottage and knocked. No one answered. He knocked again, harder than before, for behind him he heard the steps and the labored breathing of his persecutors. The same silence followed. As knocking was of no use, Pinocchio, in despair, began to kick and bang against the door, as if he wanted to break it. At the noise, a window opened, and a lovely maiden looked out. She had azure hair and a face white as wax. Her eyes were closed and her hands crossed on her breast. With a voice so weak that it could hardly be heard, she whispered, "'No one lives in this house. Everyone is dead.' "'Won't you at least open the door for me?' cried Pinocchio in a beseeching voice. I also am dead. Dead? What are you doing at the window, then? I am waiting for the coffin to take me away. After these words the little girl disappeared, and the window closed without a sound. Oh, lovely maiden with azure hair! cried Pinocchio. Open, I beg of you. Take pity on a poor boy who is being chased by two assass— <laughs> He did not finish— for two powerful hands grasped him by the neck, and the same two horrible voices growled threateningly, "'Now we have you!' The marionette, seeing death dancing before him, trembled so hard that the joints of his legs rattled, and the coins tinkled under his tongue. "'Well?' the assassins asked. "'Will you open your mouth now or not?' "'Ah! You do not answer!' Very well, this time you shall open it. Taking out two long, sharp knives, they struck two heavy blows on the marionette's back. Happily for him, Pinocchio was made of very hard wood, and the knives broke into a thousand pieces. The assassins looked at each other in dismay, holding the handles of the knives in their hands. I understand, said one of them to the other, 
There is nothing left to do now but to hang him. To hang him, repeated the other. They tied Pinocchio's hands behind his shoulders and slipped the noose around his neck. Throwing the rope over the high limb of a giant oak tree, they pulled till the poor marionette hung far up in space. Satisfied with their work, they sat on the grass, waiting for Pinocchio to give his last gasp. But after three hours the marionette's eyes were still open, his mouth still shut, and his legs kicked harder than ever. Tired of waiting, the assassins called to him mockingly, "'Good-bye till to-morrow. When we return in the morning, we hope you'll be polite enough to let us find you dead and gone, and with your mouth wide open.' With these words they went. A few minutes went by, and then a wild wind started to blow. As it shrieked and moaned, the poor little sufferer was blown to and fro like the hammer of a bell. The rocking made him seasick, and the noose, becoming tighter and tighter, choked him. Little by little a film covered his eyes. Death was creeping nearer and nearer, and the marionette still hoped for some good soul to come to his rescue, but no one appeared. As he was about to die, he thought of his poor old father, and hardly conscious of what he was saying, murmured to himself, Oh, father, dear father, if you were only here! These were his last words. He closed his eyes, opened his mouth, stretched out his legs, and hung there, as if he were dead. Chapter 16 If the poor marionette had dangled there much longer, all hope would have been lost. Luckily for him, the lovely maiden with azure hair once again looked out of her window. Filled with pity at the sight of the poor little fellow being knocked helplessly about by the wind, she clapped her hands sharply together three times. At the signal a loud whirr of wings in quick flight was heard, and a large falcon came and settled itself on the window-ledge. "'What do you command, my charming fairy?' asked the falcon, bending his beak in deep reverence, for it must be known that, after all, the lovely maiden with azure hair was none other than a very kind fairy who had lived for more than a thousand years in the vicinity of the forest. "'Do you see that marionette hanging from the limb of that giant oak tree?' "'I see him.' "'Very well. Fly immediately to him.' With your strong beak, break the knot which holds him tied, take him down, and lay him softly on the grass at the foot of the oak. The falcon flew away, and after two minutes returned, saying, I have done what you have commanded. How did you find him, alive or dead? At first glance I thought he was dead. But I found I was wrong, for as soon as I loosened the knot around his neck, he gave a long sigh and mumbled with a faint voice, Now I feel better. The fairy clapped her hands twice. A magnificent poodle appeared, walking on its hind legs just like a man. He was dressed in court livery. A tricorn trimmed with gold lace was set at a rakish angle over a wig of white curls that dropped down to his waist. He wore a jaunty coat of chocolate-colored velvet, with diamond buttons, and with two huge pockets which were always filled with bones, dropped there at dinner by his loving mistress. Breeches of crimson velvet, silk stockings, and low, silver-buckled slippers completed his costume. His tail was encased in a blue silk covering, which was to protect it from the rain. "'Come, Madero,' said the fairy to him, "'get my best coach ready, and set out toward the forest. On reaching the oak tree you will find a poor, half-dead marionette stretched out on the grass. Lift him up tenderly, place him on the silken cushions of the coach, and bring him here to me.' The poodle, to show that he understood, wagged his silk-covered tail two or three times, and set off at a quick pace. 
In a few minutes a lovely little coach, made of glass, with lining as soft as whipped cream and chocolate pudding, and stuffed with canary feathers, pulled out of the stable. It was drawn by one hundred pairs of white mice, and the poodle sat on the coachman's seat and snapped his whip gaily in the air, as if he were a real coachman in a hurry to get to his destination. In a quarter of an hour the coach was back. The fairy, who was waiting at the door of the house, lifted the poor little marionette in her arms, took him to a dainty room with mother-of-pearl walls, put him to bed, and sent immediately for the most famous doctors of the neighborhood to come to her. One after another the doctors came, a crow, an owl, and a talking cricket. "'I should like to know, Signore,' said the fairy, turning to the three doctors gathered about Pinocchio's bed, "'I should like to know if this poor marionette is dead or alive.' At this invitation the crow stepped out, and felt Pinocchio's pulse, his nose, his little toe. Then he solemnly pronounced the following words. To my mind this marionette is dead and gone, but if by any evil chance he were not, then that would be a sure sign that he is still alive. I am sorry, said the owl, to have to contradict the crow, my famous friend and colleague. To my mind this marionette is alive. But if by any evil chance he were not, then that would be a sure sign that he is wholly dead. And do you hold any opinion? the fairy asked the talking cricket. I say that a wise doctor when he does not know what he is talking about, should know enough to keep his mouth shut. However, that marionette is not a stranger to me. I have known him a long time." Pinocchio, who until then had been very quiet, shuddered so hard that the bed shook. "'That marionette,' continued the talking cricket, "'is a rascal of the worst kind.' Pinocchio opened his eyes and closed them again. He is rude, lazy, a runaway. Pinocchio hid his face under the sheets. That marionette is a disobedient son who is breaking his father's heart. Long shuddering sobs were heard, cries and deep sighs. Think how surprised everyone was when, on raising the sheets, they discovered Pinocchio half melted in tears. When the dead weep! They are beginning to recover," said the crow solemnly. "'I am sorry to contradict my famous friend and colleague,' said the owl, "'but as far as I am concerned, I think that when the dead weep it means they do not want to die.'" CHAPTER Seventeen. As soon as the three doctors had left the room, the fairy went to Pinocchio's bed and, touching him on the forehead, noticed that he was burning with fever. She took a glass of water, put a white powder into it, and, handing it to the marionette, said lovingly to him, "'Drink this, and in a few days you'll be up and well.' Pinocchio looked at the glass, made a wry face, and asked in a whining voice, "'Is it sweet or bitter?' It is bitter, but it is good for you. If it is bitter, I don't want it. Drink it. I don't like anything bitter. Drink it, and I'll give you a lump of sugar to take the bitter taste from your mouth. Where's the sugar? Here it is, said the fairy, taking a lump from a golden sugar bowl. I want the sugar first, then I'll drink the bitter water. Do you promise? Yes. The fairy gave him the sugar, and Pinocchio, after chewing and swallowing it in a twinkling, said, smacking his lips, If only sugar were medicine, I should take it every day. Now keep your promise, and drink these few drops of water. 
They'll be good for you. Pinocchio took the glass in both hands and stuck his nose into it. He lifted it to his mouth and once more stuck his nose into it. It is too bitter, much too bitter. I can't drink it. How do you know when you haven't even tasted it? I can imagine it. I smell it. I want another lump of sugar, then I'll drink it. The fairy, with the patience of a good mother, gave him more sugar and again handed him the glass. I can't drink it like that, the marionette said, making more wry faces. Why? Because that feather pillow on my feet bothers me. The fairy took away the pillow. It's no use. I can't drink it even now. What's the matter now? I don't like the way that door looks. It's half open. The fairy closed the door. I won't drink it, cried Pinocchio, bursting out crying. I won't drink this awful water. I won't. I won't. No, 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 no. My boy, you'll be sorry. I don't care. You are very sick. I don't care. In a few hours, the fever will take you far away to another world. I don't care. Aren't you afraid of death? Not a bit. I'd rather die than drink that awful medicine. At that moment, the door of the room flew open, and in came four rabbits as black as ink, carrying a small black coffin on their shoulders. What do you want from me? asked Pinocchio. We have come for you, said the largest rabbit. For me? But I'm not dead yet. No, not dead yet, but you will be in a few moments since you have refused to take the medicine which would have made you well. Oh, fairy, my fairy, the marionette cried out. Give me that glass, quick, please. I don't want to die. No, no, not yet, not yet. And holding the glass with his two hands, he swallowed the medicine at one gulp. Well, said the four rabbits, this time we have made the trip for nothing. And turning on their heels, they marched solemnly out of the room, carrying their little black coffin and muttering and grumbling between their teeth. In a twinkling, Pinocchio felt fine. With one leap he was out of bed and into his clothes. The fairy, seeing him run and jump around the room gay as a bird on wings, said to him, My medicine was good for you after all, wasn't it? Good indeed! It has given me new life! Why, then, did I have to beg you so hard to make you drink it? I'm a boy, you see, and all boys hate medicine more than they do sickness. What a shame! Boys ought to know, after all, that medicine, taken in time, can save them from much pain, and even from death. Next time I won't have to be begged so hard. I'll remember those black rabbits with the black coffin on their shoulders, and I'll take the glass and, poof, down it will go. Come here now, and tell me how it came about that you found yourselves in the hands of the assassins. It happened that Fire Eater gave me five gold pieces to give to my father, but on the way I met a fox and a cat who asked me, Do you want the five pieces to become two thousand? And I said, Yes. And they said, Come with us to the Field of Wonders. And I said, Let's go. Then they said, Let us stop at the Inn of the Red Lobster for dinner, and after midnight we'll set out again. We ate and went to sleep. When I awoke they were gone, and I started out in the darkness all alone. On the road I met two assassins dressed in black coal sacks, who said to me, Your money or your life! And I said, I haven't any money, for, you see, I had put the money under my tongue. One of them tried to put his hand in my mouth, and I bit it off and spat it out, but it wasn't a hand, it was a cat's paw and they ran after me, and I ran and ran, till at last they caught me and tied my neck with a rope and hanged me to a tree, saying, Tomorrow we'll come back for you, and you'll be dead, and your mouth will be open, 
and then we'll take the gold pieces that you have hidden under your tongue. Where are the gold pieces now? the fairy asked. I lost them, answered Pinocchio, but he told a lie, for he had them in his pocket. As he spoke, his nose, long though it was, became at least two inches longer. And where did you lose them? In the wood nearby. At this second lie his nose grew a few more inches. If you lost them in the nearby wood, said the fairy, we'll look for them and find them, for everything that is lost there is always found. Ah! Now I remember, replied the marionette, becoming more and more confused. I did not lose the gold pieces, but I swallowed them when I drank the medicine. At this third lie his nose became longer than ever, so long that he could not even turn around. If he turned to the right, he knocked it against the bed or into the window panes. If he turned to the left, he struck the walls or the door. If he raised it a bit, he almost put the fairy's eyes out. The fairy sat looking at him and laughing. "'Why do you laugh?' the marionette asked her, worried now at the sight of his growing nose. "'I am laughing at your lies.' "'How do you know I'm lying?' "'Lies, my boy, are known in a moment. There are two kinds of lies, lies with short legs and lies with long noses. Yours, just now, happen to have long noses.' Pinocchio, not knowing where to hide his shame, tried to escape from the room, but his nose had become so long that he could not get it out of the door. CHAPTER Eighteen. Crying as if his heart would break, the marionette mourned for hours over the length of his nose. No matter how he tried, it would not go through the door. The fairy showed no pity toward him, as she was trying to teach him a good lesson, so that he would stop telling lies, the worst habit any boy may acquire. But when she saw him, pale with fright and his eyes half out of his head with terror, she began to feel sorry for him, and clapped her hands together. A thousand woodpeckers flew in through the window, and settled themselves on Pinocchio's nose. They pecked and pecked so hard at that enormous nose, that in a few moments it was the same size as before. "'How good you are, my fairy!' said Pinocchio, drying his eyes. "'And how much I love you!' "'I love you, too,' answered the fairy. "'And if you wish to stay with me, you may be my little brother, and I'll be your good little sister.' "'I should like to stay, but what about my poor father?' "'I have thought of everything. Your father has been sent for, and before night he will be here.' "'Really?' cried Pinocchio joyfully. "'Then, my good fairy, if you are willing, I should like to go to meet him. I cannot wait to kiss that dear old man, who has suffered so much for my sake.' "'Surely, go ahead, but be careful not to lose your way. Take the wood-path, and you'll surely meet him.' Pinocchio set out, and as soon as he found himself in the wood, he ran like a hare. When he reached the giant oak-tree, he stopped, for he thought he heard a rustle in the brush. He was right. There stood the fox and the cat, the two travelling companions with whom he had eaten at the inn of the Red Lobster. "'Here comes our dear Pinocchio!' cried the fox, hugging and kissing him. "'How did you happen here?' "'How did you happen here?' repeated the cat. "'It is a long story.' said the marionette. Let me tell it to you. The other night, when you left me alone at the inn, I met the assassins on the road. The assassins! Oh, my poor friend! And what did they want? They wanted my gold pieces. Rascals! said the fox. The worst sort of rascals! added the cat. But I began to run, continued the marionette and they after me, 
until they overtook me and hanged me to the limb of that oak. Pinocchio pointed to the giant oak nearby. Could anything be worse? said the fox. What an awful world to live in! Where shall we find a safe place for gentlemen like ourselves? As the fox talked thus, Pinocchio noticed that the cat carried his right paw in a sling. What happened to your paw? he asked. The cat tried to answer, but he became so terribly twisted in his speech that the fox had to help him out. My friend is too modest to answer. I'll answer for him. About an hour ago we met an old wolf on the road. He was half starved and begged for help. Having nothing to give him, what do you think my friend did out of the kindness of his heart? With his teeth he bit off the paw of his front foot and threw it at that poor beast, so that he might have something to eat. As he spoke, the fox wiped off a tear. Pinocchio, almost in tears himself, whispered in the cat's ear, If all the cats were like you, how lucky the mice would be! And what are you doing here? the fox asked the marionette. I am waiting for my father, who will be here at any moment now. And your gold pieces? I still have them in my pocket, except one which I spent at the inn of the Red Lobster. To think that those four gold pieces might become two thousand to-morrow! Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you sow them in the field of wonders? Today it is impossible. I'll go with you some other time. Another day will be too late, said the fox. Why? Because that field has been bought by a very rich man, and today is the last day that it will be open to the public. How far is this field of wonders? Only two miles away. Will you come with us? We'll be there in half an hour. You can sow the money, and after a few minutes you will gather your two thousand coins and return home rich. Are you coming? Pinocchio hesitated a moment before answering, for he remembered the good fairy, old Geppetto, and the advice of the talking cricket. Then he ended by doing what all boys do when they have no heart and little brain. He shrugged his shoulders and said to the fox and the cat, Let us go. I am with you. And they went. They walked and walked for a half a day at least, and at last they came to the town called the City of Simple Simons. As soon as they entered the town, Pinocchio noticed that all the streets were filled with hairless dogs yawning from hunger, with sheared sheep trembling with cold, with combless chickens begging for a grain of wheat, with large butterflies unable to use their wings because they had sold all their lovely colors, with tailless peacocks ashamed to show themselves, and with bedraggled pheasants scuttling away hurriedly, grieving for their bright feathers of gold and silver, lost to them forever. Through this crowd of paupers and beggars a beautiful coach passed now and again. Within it sat either a fox, a hawk, or a vulture. "'Where is the field of wonders?' asked Pinocchio, growing tired of waiting. "'Be patient! It is only a few more steps away.' They passed through the city, and, just outside the walls, they stepped into a lonely field, which looked more or less like any other field. "'Here we are,' said the fox to the marionette. "'Dig a hole here and put the gold pieces into it.' The marionette obeyed. He dug the hole, put the four gold pieces into it, and covered them up very carefully. "'Now,' said the fox, "'go to that nearby brook, bring back a pail full of water, and sprinkle it over the spot.' Pinocchio followed the directions closely, but, as he had no pail, he pulled off his shoe, filled it with water, and sprinkled the earth which covered the gold. Then he asked, "'Anything else?' "'Nothing else,' 
answered the fox. Now we can go. Return here within twenty minutes, and you will find the vine grown, and the branches filled with gold pieces. Pinocchio, beside himself with joy, thanked the fox and the cat many times, and promised them each a beautiful gift. "'We don't want any of your gifts,' answered the two rogues. "'It is enough for us that we have helped you to become rich with little or no trouble. For this we are as happy as kings.' They said good-bye to Pinocchio, and, wishing him good luck, went on their way. Chapter 19 If the marionette had been told to wait a day instead of twenty minutes, the time could not have seemed longer to him. He walked impatiently to and fro, and finally turned his nose toward the field of wonders. And as he walked with hurried steps, his heart beat with an excited tick-tack, tick-tack, just as if it were a wall-clock, and his busy brain kept thinking, What if, instead of a thousand, I should find two thousand, or if instead of two thousand I should find five thousand, or one hundred thousand. I'll build myself a beautiful palace, with a thousand stables filled with a thousand wooden horses to play with, a cellar overflowing with lemonade and ice-cream soda, and a library of candies and fruits, cakes and cookies. Thus amusing himself with fancies, he came to the field. There he stopped to see if, by any chance, a vine filled with gold coins was in sight. But he saw nothing. He took a few steps forward, and still nothing. He stepped into the field. He went up to the place where he had dug the hole and buried the gold pieces. Again nothing! Pinocchio became very thoughtful, and, forgetting his good manners altogether, he pulled a hand out of his pocket and gave his head a thorough scratching. As he did so, he heard a hearty burst of laughter close to his head. He turned sharply, and there, just above him on the branch of a tree, sat a large parrot, busily preening his feathers. "'What are you laughing at?' Pinocchio asked peevishly. "'I am laughing because, in preening my feathers, I tickled myself under the wings." The marionette did not answer. He walked to the brook, filled his shoe with water, and once more sprinkled the ground which covered the gold pieces. Another burst of laughter, even more impertinent than the first, was heard in the quiet field. "'Well!' cried the marionette, angrily this time. "'May I know, Mr. Parrot, what amuses you so?' I am laughing at those simpletons who believe everything they hear, and who allow themselves to be caught so easily in the traps set for them. Do you, perhaps, mean me? I certainly do mean you, poor Pinocchio. You who are such a little silly as to believe that gold can be sown in a field just like beans or squash. I, too, believe that once and to-day I am very sorry for it. To-day, but too late, I have reached the conclusion that, in order to come by money honestly, one must work and know how to earn it with hand or brain. "'I don't know what you are talking about,' said the marionette, who was beginning to tremble with fear. "'Too bad. I'll explain myself better,' said the parrot. While you were away in the city, the fox and the cat returned here in a great hurry. They took the four gold pieces which you have buried, and ran away as fast as the wind. If you can catch them, you're a brave one." Pinocchio's mouth opened wide. He would not believe the parrot's words, and began to dig away furiously at the earth. He dug, and he dug, till the hole was as big as himself. But no money was there. Every penny was gone. In desperation he ran to the city and went straight to the courthouse to report the robbery to the magistrate. The judge was a monkey, a large gorilla, venerable with age. A flowing white beard covered his chest and he wore gold-rimmed spectacles from which the glasses had dropped out. The reason for wearing these, he said, 
was that his eyes had been weakened by the work of many years. Pinocchio, standing before him, told his pitiful tale word by word. He gave the names and the descriptions of the robbers, and begged for justice. The judge listened to him with great patience. A kind look shone in his eyes. He became very much interested in the story. He felt moved. He almost wept. When the marionette had no more to say, the judge put out his hand and rang a bell. At the sound, two large mastiffs appeared, dressed in carabineers' uniforms. Then the magistrate, pointing to Pinocchio, said in a very solemn voice, "'This poor simpleton has been robbed of four gold pieces. Take him, therefore, and throw him into prison.' The marionette, on hearing this sentence passed upon him, was thoroughly stunned. He tried to protest, but the two officers clapped their paws on his mouth and hustled him away to jail. There he had to remain for four long, weary months, and if it had not been for a very lucky chance, he probably would have had to stay there longer. For, my dear children, you must know that it happened just then that the young emperor who ruled over the city of Simple Simons had gained a great victory over his enemy, and in celebration thereof he had ordered illuminations, fireworks, shows of all kinds, and, best of all, the opening of all prison doors. "'If the others go, I go too,' said Pinocchio to the jailer. "'Not you,' answered the jailer. "'You are one of those—' "'I beg your pardon,' interrupted Pinocchio. "'I, too, am a thief.' "'In that case you also are free,' said the jailer. Taking off his cap, he bowed low and opened the door of the prison, and Pinocchio ran out and away, with never a look backward. CHAPTER Twenty. Fancy the happiness of Pinocchio on finding himself free! Without saying yes or no, he fled from the city, and set out on the road that was to take him back to the house of the lovely fairy. It had rained for many days, and the road was so muddy that, at times, Pinocchio sank down almost to his knees. But he kept on bravely. Tormented by the wish to see his father and his fairy sister with azure hair, he raced like a greyhound. As he ran, he was splashed with mud even up to his cap. "'How unhappy I have been!' he said to himself. "'And yet I deserve everything, for I am certainly very stubborn and stupid. I will always have my own way. I won't listen to those who love me and who have more brains than I. But from now on I'll be different, and I'll try to become a most obedient boy. I have found out beyond any doubt whatever, that disobedient boys are certainly far from happy, and that in the long run they always lose out. I wonder if father is waiting for me. Will I find him at the fairy's house? It is so long, poor man, since I have seen him, and I do so want his love and his kisses. And will the fairy ever forgive me for all I have done? She who has been so good to me— and to whom I owe my life. Can there be a worse or more heartless boy than I am anywhere?" As he spoke he stopped suddenly, frozen with terror. What was the matter? An immense serpent lay stretched across the road, a serpent with a bright green skin, fiery eyes which glowed and burned, and a pointed tail that smoked like a chimney. How frightened was poor Pinocchio! He ran back wildly for half a mile, and at last settled himself atop a heap of stones to wait for the serpent to go on his way, and leave the road clear for him. He waited an hour, two hours, three hours, but the serpent was always there, and even from afar one could see the flash of his red eyes and the column of smoke which rose from his long-pointed tail. Pinocchio, trying to feel very brave, walked straight up to him and said in a sweet, soothing voice, "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Serpent. Would you be so kind as to step aside to let me pass?' 
He might as well have talked to a wall. The serpent never moved. Once more, in the same sweet voice, he spoke. "'You must know, Mr. Serpent, that I am going home where my father is waiting for me. It is so long since I have seen him. Would you mind very much if I passed?' He waited for some sign of an answer to his questions, but the answer did not come. On the contrary, the green serpent, who had seemed, until then, wide awake and full of life, became suddenly very quiet and still. His eyes closed, and his tail stopped smoking. "'Is he dead, I wonder?' said Pinocchio, rubbing his hands together happily. Without a moment's hesitation he started to step over him, but he had just raised one leg when the serpent shot up like a spring, and the marionette fell head over heels backward. He fell so awkwardly that his head stuck in the mud, and there he stood with his legs straight up in the air. At the sight of the marionette kicking and squirming like a young whirlwind, the serpent laughed so heartily and so long that at last he burst an artery and died on the spot. Pinocchio freed himself from his awkward position, and once more began to run in order to reach the fairy's house before dark. As he went, the pangs of hunger grew so strong that, unable to withstand them, he jumped into a field to pick a few grapes that tempted him. Woe to him! No sooner had he reached the grapevine than, crack, went his legs. The poor marionette was caught in a trap set there by a farmer for some weasels, which came every night to steal his chickens. CHAPTER Twenty One. Pinocchio, as you may well imagine, began to scream and weep and beg, but all was of no use, for no houses were to be seen, and not a soul passed by on the road. Night came on. A little because of the sharp pain in his legs, a little because of fright at finding himself alone in the darkness of the field, the marionette was about to faint, when he saw a tiny glow-worm flickering by. He called to her and said, "'Dear little glow-worm, will you set me free?' "'Poor little fellow,' replied the glow-worm, stopping to look at him with pity. "'How came you to be caught in this trap?' I stepped into this lonely field to take a few grapes, and— Are the grapes yours? No. Who has taught you to take things that do not belong to you? I was hungry. Hunger, my boy, is no reason for taking something which belongs to another. It's true! It's true! cried Pinocchio in tears. I won't do it again! Just then the conversation was interrupted by approaching footsteps. It was the owner of the field, who was coming on tiptoes to see if, by chance, he had caught the weasels which had been eating his chickens. Great was his surprise when, on holding up his lantern, he saw that, instead of a weasel, he had caught a boy. "'Ah, you little thief!' said the farmer in an angry voice. "'So you are the one who steals my chickens!' "'No! Not I! No, no!' cried Pinocchio, sobbing bitterly. "'I came here only to take a very few grapes.' "'He who steals grapes may very easily steal chickens also. Take my word for it. I'll give you a lesson that you'll remember for a long while.' He opened the trap, grabbed the marionette by the collar, and carried him to the house as if he were a puppy. When he reached the yard in front of the house, he flung him to the ground, put a foot on his neck, and said to him roughly, "'It is late now, and it's time for bed. Tomorrow we'll settle matters. In the meantime, since my watchdog died today, you may take his place and guard my hen-house.' No sooner said than done. He slipped a dog-collar around Pinocchio's neck, and tightened it so that it would not come off. A long iron chain was tied to the collar. The other end of the chain was nailed to the wall. "'If to-night it should happen to rain,' said the farmer, "'you can sleep in that little doghouse nearby, where you will find plenty of straw for a soft bed. 
It has been Malampo's bed for three years, and it will be good enough for you. And if by any chance any thieves should come, be sure to bark. After this last warning, the farmer went into the house and closed the door and barred it. Poor Pinocchio huddled close to the doghouse more dead than alive from cold, hunger, and fright. Now and again he pulled and tugged at the collar which nearly choked him, and cried out in a weak voice, "'I deserve it! Yes, I deserve it! I have been nothing but a truant and a vagabond. I have never obeyed any one, and I have always done as I pleased. If I were only like so many others, and had studied and worked, and stayed with my poor old father, I should not find myself here now, in this field, and in the darkness, taking the place of a farmer's watchdog. Oh, if I could start all over again! But what is done can't be undone, and I must be patient." After this little sermon to himself, which came from the very depths of his heart, Pinocchio went into the doghouse and fell asleep. Even though a boy may be very unhappy, he very seldom loses sleep over his worries. The marionette, being no exception to this rule, slept on peacefully for a few hours till well along toward midnight, when he was awakened by strange whisperings and stealthy sounds coming from the yard. He stuck his nose out of the doghouse and saw four slender hairy animals. They were weasels, small animals very fond of both eggs and chickens. One of them left her companions, and going to the door of the doghouse, said in a sweet voice, "'Good evening, Melampo.' "'My name is not Melampo,' answered Pinocchio. "'Who are you, then?' "'I am Pinocchio.' "'What are you doing here?' "'I'm the watchdog.' "'But where is Melampo? Where is the old dog who used to live in this house?' "'He died this morning.' died poor beast he was so good still judging by your face i think you too are a good-natured dog i beg your pardon i am not a dog what are you then i am a marionette are you taking the place of the watchdog i'm sorry to say that i am i'm being punished well I shall make the same terms with you that we had with the dead Melampo. I am sure you will be glad to hear them. And what are the terms? This is our plan. We'll come once in a while, as in the past, to pay a visit to this hen-house, and we'll take away eight chickens. Of these, seven are for us, and one for you, provided, of course, that you will make believe you are sleeping and will not bark for the farmer." "'Did Melampo really do that?' asked Pinocchio. "'Indeed he did, and because of that we were the best of friends. "'Sleep away peacefully, and remember that before we go "'we shall leave you a nice fat chicken "'all ready for your breakfast in the morning. "'Is that understood?' "'Even too well,' answered Pinocchio, "'and shaking his head in a threatening manner, "'he seemed to say,' We'll talk this over in a few minutes, my friends." As soon as the four weasels had talked things over, they went straight to the chicken coop which stood close to the doghouse. Digging busily with teeth and claws, they opened the little door and slipped in. But they were no sooner in than they heard the door close with a sharp bang. The one who had done the trick was Pinocchio, who, not satisfied with that, dragged a heavy stone in front of it. That done, he started to bark, and he barked as if he were a real watchdog. Bow, wow, 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 wow. The farmer heard the loud barks and jumped out of bed. Taking his gun, he leaped to the window and shouted, "'What's the matter?' "'The thieves are here,' answered Pinocchio. "'Where are they?' "'In the chicken coop.' "'I'll come down in a second. And, in fact, he was down in the yard in a twinkling, and running toward the chicken coop. He opened the door, pulled out the weasels one by one, and after tying them in a bag, said to them in a happy voice, "'You're in my hands at last. 
I could punish you now, but I'll wait. In the morning you may come with me to the inn, and there you'll make a fine dinner for some hungry mortal. It is really too great an honor for you, one you do not deserve. But as you see, I'm really a very kind and generous man, and I'm going to do this for you. Then he went up to Pinocchio and began to pet and caress him. How did you ever find them out so quickly? And to think that Melampo, my faithful Melampo, never saw them in all these years. The marionette could have told, then and there, all he knew about the shameful contract between the dog and the weasels. But thinking of the dead dog, he said to himself, Melampo is dead. What is the use of accusing him? The dead are gone, and they cannot defend themselves. The best thing to do is to leave them in peace. Were you awake or asleep when they came? continued the farmer. I was asleep, answered Pinocchio, but they awakened me with their whisperings. One of them even came to the door of the doghouse and said to me, If you promise not to bark, we will make you a present of one of the chickens for your breakfast. Did you hear that? They had the audacity to make such a proposition as that to me. For you must know that, though I am a very wicked marionette full of faults, still I have never been, nor shall ever be, bribed. Fine boy! cried the farmer, slapping him on the shoulder in a friendly way. You ought to be proud of yourself. And to show you what I think of you, you are free from this instant. And he slipped the dog collar from his neck. Chapter twenty three. As soon as Pinocchio no longer felt the shameful weight of the dog collar around his neck, he started to run across the fields and meadows, and never stopped till he came to the main road that was to take him to the fairy's house. When he reached it, he looked into the valley far below him, and there he saw the wood where unluckily he had met the fox and the cat and the tall oak-tree where he had been hanged. But though he searched far and near, he could not see the house where the fairy with the azure hair lived. He became terribly frightened, and, running as fast as he could, he finally came to the spot where it had once stood. The little house was no longer there. In its place lay a small marble slab, which bore this sad inscription, Here lies the lovely fairy with azure hair, who died of grief when abandoned by her little brother, Pinocchio. The poor marionette was heartbroken at reading these words. He fell to the ground, and, covering the cold marble with kisses, burst into bitter tears. He cried all night, and dawn found him still there, though his tears had dried and only hard dry sobs shook his wooden frame but these were so loud that they could be heard by the faraway hills. As he sobbed, he said to himself, "'Oh, my fairy, my dear, dear fairy, why did you die? Why did I not die, who am so bad, instead of you, who are so good? And my father, where can he be? Please, dear fairy, tell me where he is, and I shall never, never leave him again.' You are not really dead, are you? If you love me, you will come back, alive as before. Don't you feel sorry for me? I'm so lonely. If the two assassins come, they'll hang me again from the giant oak tree, and I will really die this time. What shall I do alone in the world? Now that you are dead, my father is lost, where shall I eat? Where shall I sleep? Who will make my new clothes? Oh, I want to die. Yes, I want to die. Oh, oh, oh. Poor Pinocchio. He even tried to tear his hair, but as it was only painted on his wooden head, he could not even pull it. Just then a large pigeon flew far above him. Seeing the marionette, he cried to him, Tell me, little boy, what are you doing there? "'Can't you see? I'm crying,' said Pinocchio, lifting his head toward the voice and rubbing his eyes with his sleeve. "'Tell me,' asked the pigeon, "'do you by chance know of a marionette, 
Pinocchio by name. Pinocchio! Did you say Pinocchio? replied the marionette, jumping to his feet. Why, I am Pinocchio! At this answer the pigeon flew swiftly down to the earth. He was much larger than a turkey. Then you know Geppetto also? Do I know him? He's my father, my poor dear father. Has he perhaps spoken to you of me? Will you take me to him? Is he still alive? Answer me, please. Is he still alive? I left him three days ago on the shore of a large sea. What was he doing? He was building a little boat with which to cross the ocean. For the last four months that poor man has been wandering around Europe looking for you. Not having found you yet, he has made up his mind to look for you in the New World, far across the ocean. How far is it from here to the shore? asked Pinocchio anxiously. More than fifty miles. Fifty miles! Oh, dear pigeon, how I wish I had your wings! If you want to come, I'll take you with me. How? Astride my back. Are you very heavy? Heavy? Not at all. I'm only a feather. Very well. Saying nothing more, Pinocchio jumped on the pigeon's back, and as he settled himself, he cried out gaily, Gallop on, gallop on, my pretty steed. I'm in a great hurry. The pigeon flew away, and in a few minutes he had reached the clouds. The marionette looked to see what was below them. His head swam, and he was so frightened that he clutched wildly at the pigeon's neck to keep himself from falling. They flew all day. Toward evening the pigeon said, "'I'm very thirsty.' "'And I'm very hungry,' said Pinocchio. Let us stop a few minutes at that pigeon coop down there. Then we can go on and be at the seashore in the morning. They went into the empty coop, and there they found nothing but a bowl of water and a small basket filled with chickpeas. The marionette had always hated chickpeas. According to him, they had always made him sick. But that night he ate them with a relish. As he finished them, he turned to the pigeon and said, I never should have thought that chickpeas could be so good. You must remember, my boy, answered the pigeon, that hunger is the best sauce. After resting a few minutes longer, they set out again. The next morning they were at the seashore. Pinocchio jumped off the pigeon's back, and the pigeon, not wanting any thanks for a kind deed, flew away swiftly, and disappeared. The shore was full of people, shrieking and tearing their hair as they looked toward the sea. "'What has happened?' asked Pinocchio of a little old woman. "'A poor old father lost his only son some time ago, and today he built a tiny boat for himself, in order to go in search of him across the ocean. The water is very rough, and we're afraid he will be drowned. Where is the little boat? There, straight down there, answered the little old woman, pointing to a tiny shadow, no bigger than a nutshell, floating on the sea. Pinocchio looked closely for a few minutes, and then gave a sharp cry. It's my father! It's my father! Meanwhile, the little boat, tossed about by the angry waters, appeared and disappeared in the waves. And Pinocchio, standing on a high rock, tired out with searching, waved to him with hand and cap, and even with his nose. It looked as if Geppetto, though far away from the shore, recognized his son, for he took off his cap and waved also. He seemed to be trying to make everyone understand that he would come back if he were able, but the sea was so heavy that he could do nothing with his oars. Suddenly a huge wave came, and the boat disappeared. They waited and waited for it, but it was gone. "'Poor man!' said the fisher-folk on the shore, whispering a prayer as they turned to go home. Just then a desperate cry was heard. 
Turning around, the fisher folk saw Pinocchio dive into the sea, and heard him cry out, "'I'll save him! I'll save my father!' The marionette, being made of wood, floated easily along and swam like a fish in the rough water. Now and again he disappeared, only to reappear once more. In a twinkling he was far away from land. At last he was completely lost to view. "'Poor boy!' cried the fisher-folk on the shore, and again they mumbled a few prayers as they returned home. CHAPTER Twenty Four. Pinocchio, spurred on by the hope of finding his father and of being in time to save him, swam all night long. And what a horrible night it was! It poured rain, it hailed, it thundered, and the lightning was so bright that it turned the night into day. At dawn he saw, not far away from him, a long stretch of sand. It was an island in the middle of the sea. Pinocchio tried his best to get there, but he couldn't. The waves played with him and tossed him about as if he were a twig or a bit of straw. At last, and luckily for him, a tremendous wave tossed him to the very spot where he wanted to be. The blow from the wave was so strong that, as he fell to the ground, his joints cracked and almost broke. But, nothing daunted, he jumped to his feet and cried, once more I have escaped with my life!" Little by little the sky cleared. The sun came out in full splendor, and the sea became as calm as a lake. Then the marionette took off his clothes and laid them on the sand to dry. He looked over the waters to see whether he might catch sight of a boat with a little man in it. He searched and he searched, but he saw nothing except sea and sky, and far away a few sails so small that they might have been birds. "'If only I knew the name of this island,' he said to himself, "'if I even knew what kind of people I would find here. But whom shall I ask? There is no one here.' The idea of finding himself in so lonesome a spot made him so sad that he was about to cry, but just then he saw a big fish swimming nearby, with his head far out of the water. Not knowing what to call him, the marionette said to him, "'Hey there, Mr. Fish! May I have a word with you?' "'Even, too, if you want,' answered the fish, who happened to be a very polite dolphin. "'Will you please tell me if, on this island, there are places where one may eat without necessarily being eaten?' "'Surely there are,' answered the dolphin. "'In fact, you'll find one not far from this spot.' And how shall I get there? Take that path on your left and follow your nose. You can't go wrong. Tell me another thing. You who travel day and night through the sea, did you not perhaps meet a little boat with my father in it? And who is your father? He is the best father in the world, even as I am the worst son that can be found. In the storm of last night, answered the dolphin, the little boat must have been swamped. And my father? By this time he must have been swallowed by the terrible shark, which for the last few days has been bringing terror to these waters. Is this shark very big? asked Pinocchio, who was beginning to tremble with fright. Is he big? replied the dolphin. Just to give you an idea of his size, let me tell you that he is larger than a five-story building, and that he has a mouth so big and so deep that a whole train and engine could easily get into it. "'Mother mine!' cried the marionette, scared to death, and dressing himself as fast as he could, he turned to the dolphin and said, "'Farewell, Mr. Fish. Pardon the bother, and many thanks for your kindness.' This said, he took the path at so swift a gait that he seemed to fly, and at every small sound he heard, he turned in fear to see whether the terrible shark, five stories high and with a train in his mouth, was following him. After walking a half hour, he came to a small country called the Land of the Busy Bees. The streets were filled with people running to and fro about their tasks. Everyone worked, everyone had something to do. 
even if one were to search with a lantern, not one idle man or one tramp could have been found. "'I understand,' said Pinocchio at once, wearily. "'This is no place for me. I was not born for work.' But in the meantime he began to feel hungry, for it was twenty-four hours since he had eaten. What was to be done? There were only two means left to him in order to get a bite to eat. He either had to work or to beg. He was ashamed to beg, because his father had always preached to him that begging should be done only by the sick or the old. He had said that the real poor in this world, deserving of our pity and help, were only those who, either through age or sickness, had lost the means of earning their bread with their own hands. All others should work, and if they didn't, and went hungry, so much the worse for them. Just then a man passed by, worn out and wet with perspiration, pulling, with difficulty, two heavy carts filled with coal. Pinocchio looked at him, and judging him by his looks to be a kind man, said to him with eyes downcast in shame, "'Will you be so good as to give me a penny, for I am faint with hunger?' <sighs> "'Not only one penny,' answered the coal-man. "'I'll give you four if you will help me pull these two wagons.' "'I am surprised,' answered the marionette, very much offended. "'I wish you to know that I never have been a donkey, nor have I ever pulled a wagon.' "'So much the better for you,' answered the coal-man. "'Then, my boy, if you are really faint with hunger—' Eat two slices of your pride, and I hope they don't give you indigestion." A few minutes after, a bricklayer passed by, carrying a pail full of plaster on his shoulder. "'Good man, will you be kind enough to give a penny to a poor boy who is yawning from hunger?' "'Gladly,' answered the bricklayer. "'Come with me and carry some plaster, and instead of one penny I'll give you five but the plaster is heavy," answered Pinocchio, and the work too hard for me. If the work is too hard for you, my boy, enjoy your yawns, and may they bring you luck. In less than a half hour at least twenty people passed, and Pinocchio begged of each one, but they all answered, Aren't you ashamed? Instead of being a beggar in the streets, why don't you look for work and earn your own bread? Finally a little woman went by carrying two water-jugs. "'Good woman, will you allow me to have a drink from one of your jugs?' asked Pinocchio, who was burning up with thirst. "'With pleasure, my boy,' she answered, setting the two jugs on the ground before him. When Pinocchio had had his fill he grumbled, as he wiped his mouth, "'My thirst is gone, if I could only as easily get rid of my hunger.' On hearing these words, the good little woman immediately said, "'If you help me to carry these jugs home, I'll give you a slice of bread.' Pinocchio looked at the jug and said neither yes nor no. "'And with the bread I'll give you a nice dish of cauliflower with white sauce on it.' Pinocchio gave the jug another look and said neither yes nor no. "'And after the cauliflower some cake and jam.' At this last bribery Pinocchio could no longer resist, and said firmly, "'Very well. I'll take the jug home for you.' The jug was very heavy, and the marionette, not being strong enough to carry it with his hands, had to put it on his head. When they arrived home, the little woman made Pinocchio sit down at a small table, and placed before him the bread, the cauliflower, and the cake. Pinocchio did not eat he devoured. His stomach seemed a bottomless pit. His hunger finally appeased, he raised his head to thank his kind benefactress. But he had not looked at her long when he gave a cry of surprise, and sat there with his eyes wide open, his fork in the air, and his mouth filled with bread and cauliflower. "'Why all this surprise?' asked the good woman, laughing. "'Because!' answered Pinocchio, stammering and stuttering, 
because you look like you remind me of yes yes the same voice the same eyes the same hair yes 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 you also have the same as your hair she had oh my little fairy my little fairy tell me that it is you don't make me cry any longer if you only knew i have cried so much i have suffered so and pinocchio threw himself on the floor and clasped the knees of the mysterious little woman